I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. As we look this morning at verses 25 to 32, and as you're turning there, praise team, thank you so much for leading us so well. And those of you that are not only here but joining us online, I pray that uh, God has richly um, met you this week, and I pray that this will be a time for us to be able to come together as a body of believers to get around His Word. So uh, out of honor of His Word, would you stand as we read again Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 25, going to verse 32. And this is the Word of the Lord. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy and perfect word. You may be seated. So God has called us to take his gospel and to take his word and to take it out of the garage, really, and to get it out upon the highway. I think all of us may remember that time where we had a little bit of that freedom to be able to drive. My parents had two types of cars. One was a was an automatic and another was a stick shift. And I remember I was doing okay with the automatic, but I do know that I was having some trouble with the stick shift. And, uh, but that was going to be my car. My father took the other one to work, so I had to figure out how to drive that. Um, as an aside, the way that I figured out how to drive it was it was actually a dream. I actually dreamed about it I was, I was, because I was having a problem finding that friction point. And I dreamed about it, and I was able to get in, and I was able to go and get it out sluggishly out on the road, but I was able to do so. And I think when we talk about Our Christian walk and Christian life is not simply something that is supposed to be just learned about and just talked about. It's supposed to be lived out. We're supposed to take it out of the garage and get it out on the highway. At the very beginning, I read to you the Ten Commandments, which maybe as as we read through this, you saw a little bit of the Ten Commandments, a little bit of a shadow of the Ten Commandments in this particular passage. But I, I, I remember a time in college and just a bit after where there was this big argument about whether the Ten Commandments should be displayed in public places. Now, in 2005, there was a couple of court cases that made it to the Supreme Court. Both said that it was okay for those to be, for those, um, the, um, the Ten Commandments to actually be displayed in those public areas. And it was a great win for religious liberty, but it also exposed something else. You see, while we were having these conversations, there would be these folks who were against having the Ten Commandments in, the, um, in these public places. They would go to churches or they would go to Christian colleges and stuff, and they would ask two questions. The first question was, do you believe in the Ten Commandments? Well, of course, they would say, well, of course, absolutely, we do believe in the Ten Commandments. And then they would ask the second question, how many can you name? And there would be article upon article upon article that would come out that most people who wanted to have the Ten Commandments put in these public places didn't actually know what the commandment said. It also reminded me of a, of a joke that I had heard regarding this, where it was this husband and wife, they were talking to each other, and the husband who loved the Ten Commandments, he said, I really wish that I could go to Mount Sinai and stand on the top of Mount Sinai and just shout out the Ten Commandments, to which his wife countered, well, maybe it would be better, instead of going to Mount Sinai and shouting out the Ten Commandments, that you would actually stay home and live them out. You know, that's the idea. 
And what God has given in His Word as far as the Ten Commandments are concerned, you know, the, the, the first table of the commands are about how we deal with in our interactions with God, commandments one to four. And then commandments five to ten are that second table, which is how we love our neighbor. This is why Jesus said, you know, love God with everything you have. Love your neighbor as yourself. On these hang all of the law and the prophets. Even the Ten Commandments show that. Love God with everything you have. Love your neighbor as yourself. And this is what happens here. And so we see a shadow of the Ten Commandments in this passage of Scripture. And again, when you look at Ephesians, the first three chapters are about our position in Christ. Chapters 4 to 6 are about our practice. How do we live out who we are in Jesus? Well, this continues to move ahead. And I'm not going to cover all uh, all eight of these verses. In fact, I'm going to cover verses 25 to 29 this morning, and I'm going to cover verses 30 to 32 next week. There's just too much to cover, and I honestly don't want to hurry it along, and I don't want to keep you here till 1 o'clock. So you're welcome, right? You're welcome. So let's look at three areas that God is talking about in this passage and looking about how Christians are called to put on the new self. That's what was talked about in the last paragraph. But what does this new self look like? Well, Here's three areas of our lives that need to be addressed and are addressed in this passage. Number one, it's our mouth. It's our mouth. Now, the ninth commandment says, do not bear false witness against your neighbor. Exodus 20, 16. That's where that's found. And because God is truth and Christ is the way and the truth and the life, and as you go back to Ephesians 4, 21, it talks about how all truth is in Jesus. So if Jesus lives in us, we need to be about truth. What our mouths are saying need to be about truth. Ephesians 4, 15 talks about speaking the truth in love. So as God is in us, we speak the truth, but we also speak the truth with an idea of loving others as God has called us to love ourselves, and moving forward in a way that's all about truth. Alistair Begg, he said that the ninth commandment is a call to truthfulness, a commitment to truth that is more than skin deep. And so the shadow of the ninth commandment is here in these verses. There's actually two verses that talk about it. Verse 25, therefore having put away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For me, we are members one of another. And then verse 29, it talks about let no corrupting talk, let no decaying, let no perverse talk come out of your mouths, but only as such as good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. When they're talking about that corrupting talk, we are not just talking about profanity and, and swearing, because um, as one person said, profanity is an empty mind trying to express itself. But we're not talking about that. We're even talking about even if you don't use the curse words. You're talking in a way that is undermining and tearing down and not building up. And verse 31 talks about it a little bit as well when it's mentioning slander, which is actually what bearing false witness is. You're slandering someone with what you're saying. So the connective tissue with all of these verses is this, is that there's a love of God which leads to a love of truth. And a love of God which leads to a love of neighbor. And so we deal with each other because we're recognizing that we are, as it says in verse 25, members of one another. Two ways to think about that. One is we're members of one another as a body of believers. And so as a body of believers, we love each other, but we also tell the truth to each other, even if it hurts and even if it may at, at first seem like it's just absolutely mean. But we, we, we pull back on it and say, no, no, we're telling you the truth because we want you to live as God designed you to live in your thinking, in your speech, in your actions. We are members of one another. We are to take care of one another, and that's in our speech. Now, if you go to verse 29, again, oh, I, I didn't give you the second lane. Sorry. First lane, members. Second lane, that we're members of one another as image bearers of God. So even if we don't, in this lane, even if we don't share common belief, 
there is an aspect of it where our words are supposed to be in the culture to build up the culture. We don't simply run away. In fact, we've seen, we've seen this too much. We run away from the culture and get into our churches. We get into our schools. We get into our Christian-based everything. And what's happened is we've pulled Christians out of the culture. Well, there needs to be an aspect where we're putting Christians into the culture. We're putting Christians into jobs. We're putting Christians into politics so that we are bringing the truth of the gospel in love to build up the country, to build up the country, not based upon our own views, but based upon what the Word of God is saying. When we look at James chapter 3, I mean, that's the chapter that talks about the tongue. James chapter 3, in fact, those that want to be teachers, be careful because you'll be held you know, with, with double force as far as judgment is concerned because you're using your words to speak about God's words. But in James 3 verse 6, the tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person. It sets the whole course of his life on fire. And is itself on fire by hell. I have a red cup here that is filled with water. It gets a little dry. So every so often I need to make sure that I'm drinking of this every so often. Now what would happen if I would take a couple of drops. And I would put those couple of drops on the ground here. On the floor here I should say. What would happen? Well what would happen is there is an area here that's wet. Now what would happen if... I reached into my pocket if I were to carry these things. If I were to reach into my pocket and I would put out a match and I would put that on a similar area and I would drop it, what would happen? Well, if left unchecked, that little match would burn this whole room. That little match could burn the whole building down. And in fact, if it was left unchecked, it would actually go through the entire community. That's what would end up happening. So it is with our words. Our words are considered like a fire. It's a fire that you can say those two words and they may seem very little, but boy, they can do some damage. You may have had someone say something to you, or you may, have, you may be able to remember what someone said to you 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago that really began to move in you and work in you and begin to identify, maybe you've held that to that identity all these years based upon what someone has said. You know, they say it takes about seven positive compliments or comments, positive comments, to overcome one negative one. Our words matter. Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. And that's what we have to recognize is that we come together. That's why we worship together. Uh, Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. Let us consider, consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. Uh, to encourage, to give courage through your words. You're giving courage to someone. Encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. So just a word here. That's why it's so important for us that if we are physically able to come and worship together, we need to physically come and worship together. It is difficult to encourage one another in these gatherings if we're not here. I'd say it's even impossible. So let's encourage one another, especially now that we're able to open up. Let's encourage one another to come and to be among us. Otherwise, we, we miss out that opportunity to encourage and to Stir up one another to love and good works. So what words are we using? What kind of inventory? What kind of posts are we putting out on, on social media if you're into that kind of thing? What are we doing to build people up? Are we getting over in the corner and gossiping? Well, let's make sure that we're gossiping the gospel, right? Where get over in the corner and talk about what Jesus has done. Talk about what he's done in you. Be, have that testimony rather than gossip about what someone else is doing because that gets us into the second part about not only our mouth, but let's go right into it, our hearts. Our hearts. We go to verse 26. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. 
Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And give no opportunity to the devil. In Proverbs 4.23, it says, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Keep your heart. Watch what's going on in your heart. Guard your heart. Don't let anything in there, because all of us have had something come across our hearts or come across our minds, and we're saying, where did that come from? How'd that get there? You know, um, uh, David came into the office the other day, and we were, we were sitting and, and talking, and um, there's a book on my shelf. I forget who it was written by. There was a book on my shelf about emotional intelligence. Dad, what's that? Well, and I mentioned to him is that it used to be where you were determined how well you could do something based on your IQ, your intelligence quotient, your IQ. But then he began to realize there was more things to it than that. There's more things that there's, there's an emotional intelligence. It's about how you process things and what, how you process what's going on in your heart, how you process what's going on in, outside of you. It's not just flat intellect. There's more to us than that. And so as we look at this, it is an, it, now even the secular world is beginning to realize we've got to check what's happening and what's going on in our hearts. Warren Wiersbe defined anger as an emotional arousal caused by something that displeases us. Now think about when you've gotten angry at someone or someone has gotten angry at you. Why? It's because there's something inside of you that says they are doing something that is wrong. They are doing something that displeases me. They are doing something that is not abiding by my law. Forget God's law at this point, my law. This is how I think things should be. You're not doing what I want you to do. I get angry. So how, how does this connect to a command? Well, the command is, the, the, the one command about this is the command of not murdering. Do not murder. And how does that connect? Jesus connects it. In Matthew 5, 21 to 22, Jesus talks about a bad type of anger. Now, there's good anger, but there's also a bad type of anger. But in Matthew 5, verses 21 and 22, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, You fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So anger is not something to be trifled with. What you're doing is you're putting your law rather than God's law on a, on a fellow image bearer of God. And when you do that, all sorts of things can come, can come and happen. So Jesus here is combining the issues of the mouth and the heart. And no wonder, because Jesus says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what comes out of your mouth, especially when you're not expecting it or when you don't, you're not prepared to have that restraint there. What comes out of your mouth is who you are, is what's going on actually in your heart. Jesus even says that if you're angry like this, that it affects your worship. If, if you, it says, it, it, what Jesus is saying here is this, if you're angry with someone or you know someone's angry with you, then you leave your offering and you go and be reconciled. Why? Because think of all that Jesus did to reconcile you to his dad, to his, to his father. We are to be reconcilers as well, not to leave those angry issues open. Now, again, just because you may go and try to get it fixed up, does that mean that everybody else is going to respond to your, to your good work or to your trying to be reconciled? No. But who's the ultimate audience? The ultimate audience is, it's, it's God. You still have to be obedient with what you know and go and work on that. Even if it means you have to get up right now to go fix that. Well, what are people going to think? Who cares what they think? What matters is, what is God saying on the matter? And that's, this may be one of the reasons why some may come into the church and they say, I'm not getting anything out of worship. I'm not getting, well, what are you, one, what are you putting into it? And second of all, is there something going on to what Jesus is saying that is keeping you back from being able to worship? You know, it's easy to blame everything and everybody else. 
But when there's something that Jesus is saying that is affecting our worship in such a way, well, no wonder we have a hard time getting anything out of it because we're not putting obedience into it. Another thing that can happen is, going back to what um, Paul was talking about, is if we don't take care of these matters in short order, the devil will get a foothold. I think the terminology nowadays is the devil will be living rent-free in your heart and in your head. If you don't take care of this issue, because now again, there is a, there is a good anger. Jesus is ta- will talk about a good anger. The bad anger is this. When you are putting your own preferences or agendas or traditions on somebody else and expecting them to follow suit and they, say, and they don't observe that, then you may get angry at them. You, you have to know, by reading the Word of God and understanding your own heart, the difference between what good anger is and what bad anger is, what righteous anger is and what selfish anger is, because sometimes if you're not recognizing it, it can all be the same. Well, of course God's going to listen to what I think. Of course God agrees with what I think. But if you're not in the Word and letting the Word be in you, you're not going to have that wisdom or discernment to know which is which. And it's no wonder we're all messed up. So he says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the devil get do not let the sun go down on your anger. Now, I've known couples that have done this. They say they won't go to bed until they get that argument straightened out. Well, that messes you up for the next couple of days because you didn't get a good night's sleep. The, but I, I appreciate the effort, right? The idea, though, is to make sure you are taking care of matters in quick, short order. He even says in one of the, ver- one of the translations of Matthew 5, 24, keep short accounts. Don't let anything hang. And some of you, you may have been hanging on to something for decades. And it messes with you. It messes with your mind and your heart and your health and your relationships that come along later on. And, we, and Jesus is saying, take care of that. Forgive. Recognize how I work to reconcile you. Well, what, what's the good anger? Well, when Jesus was talking about this in John 2, verses 13 to 16, this is when he cleansed the temple. He made a whip of cords, drove them all out of the temple. He says, do not make my father's house a house of trade. And the disciples remembered from Psalm 69, 9, zeal for your house has consumed me. So when you see injustice in the world and unrighteousness in the world and a lack of purity of worship among God's people, that's the time to get righteously indignant, righteously angry, but to use that to a point of being able to help. Don't just walk away and don't just give up. You use that to get in there and say, this is how it should be. But make sure, again, you're not putting your own preferences and agendas and traditions in there. That, they, they, those can be tools, but don't mistake that for God's word. Remember, uh, well, it just ran across my brain. Mark 7. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. In other words, you can't teach your preferences or agendas or traditions as if they're command or doctrines of God. Know that they're your preferences and agendas and traditions. And let God's doctrines be God's doctrines, but recognize the difference between that and your own personal preferences. So our hearts... Next, our hands. And the, and the commandment there is the eighth commandment of do not steal. And there we see in verse 28, let the thief of, of Ephesians 4, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him do labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone that's in need. The pattern is if your hearts, let's make sure we get the first one. If your mouth and your hearts and your hands, the, the, the pattern is you can use those things to take for yourself. But rather, we're to use all those things to give out of love for neighbor, out of love for God. And that's where we see that the Greek word for steal is the word klepto. That's where we get the word kleptomaniac. You were, I know you were wondering about that. Where did that word come from? 
Uh, probably not. But the idea is the same. Klepto, and, it, and it's not simply about taking and stealing. It's about taking that which is not yours, which if you put it like that, can, can make it a little wider than that. There's aspects of it where we are making sure that our actions are not taking something from someone else that will undermine them. In other words, God has called us to work. He's called us to be active. He's not called us to be lazy. A lazy life is a sinful life. In 2 Thessalonians 3, Paul writes, Keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness, or idleness, um, not doing anything. Keep away from a brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. In other words, we're called to live a life that is focused and we're called to live a life that is disciplined. Disciplined from where? Focused on the things of God and disciplined. That's where we are. Later in uh, verses 11 and 12, for we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Listen, I know that there's ups and downs in every culture and every economic cycle to where there can be more jobs available and then there's times when it seems to be less jobs available. And I recognize even with COVID, you know, pre-COVID there were some issues, I'm sure. But during COVID and now there's even more issues and it's really difficult. In fact, it's made it hard for those who are living in Denver because of the market and because of the, the job situation. You know, we, we had another young family that is moving back east where the market is a little bit better. So that, that, but the general aspect and the general understanding is this. We are not called as God's people to be lazy. In fact, we are called to work. Colossians 3, 23 and 24. Work as unto the Lord and not unto man. You know, well, I'll work for the Lord if he calls me into the missions work or he calls me into ministry. I used to think that until I actually read the Bible and realized that whoever I was working for, they were not my ultimate boss. God was. Christ was. They are my boss. If you're an employer, if you employ people, you're not a Christian's ultimate boss, but what ends up happening is if we realize that we're working for the Lord and not unto men, then Christians should be the most industrious and the most conscientious and the most honest workers you have. And that's, what the mar that's why we need Christians in the marketplace, not putting on what the culture is telling you to do on how to get ahead, but no, but being salt and light in that world to show the world this way is the best way. No, I may not always get ahead. No, I may not get that promotion. But you know what? I'm making much of Jesus, and he's pleased with me. And when we talk about Jesus being enough, that is another spoke on that wheel. Is Jesus enough for that? And I believe he is. In fact, I, I know, I know he is. When you read through Proverbs, Proverbs 6, Proverbs 26, the common description for someone that's lazy is a sluggard, one that is moving slow and it takes every bit of energy they have just to do a little bit. Over and against the ant. The ant has an internal motor. The ant doesn't have to have anybody telling them what to do, doesn't have to have an army to tell them what to do or a commander to tell them what to do. He knows what to do and he gets it done. And that's what the Holy Spirit does for us. The Holy Spirit as Christians puts that internal motor in us, both in the marketplace and in ministry, gets us going, gets us moving to where we're, we're because we're working for God. We're not working for man's pleasure, we're working for God. And then it moves us, you see? And that that, that, that changes everything because that's what the gospel does. The gospel of Jesus Christ reorients our minds and hearts. The gospel pours Christ's love into us so that we can be a conduit for loving others. He pours his work and his energy into us so that we work for him and others are beneficiaries of that. Proverbs 26 a perpetual, is about a perpetual fear. There's a lion in the, in the road. There's a lion in the streets. In other words, they don't want to get out of the bed because they're afraid of all the obstacles that might be there. Been there? Done that? I think we all have to a degree. But we don't look to the lion to determine what, we're, what our next move is. 
We look to the Lion of Judah. We look to Jesus for what to do. We keep our eyes on Jesus, not on those obstacles. We're aware of them. We get it, but they don't define us. They don't define our movement. When Christ has called us to go, we go. When Christ calls us to move, we move. So this lazy person has no internal motor unless someone makes them do it, unless they're afraid of being fired. They're afraid of getting their parents' wrath. No! Internal motor. See what needs to be done. We do it. Why? Because we're working for God. We're living for God. We're taking that out of the garage and putting it out on to the highway. So as I think of mouths and, and, and hearts and, and hands, I, I, I just want to give you just a couple of examples that have happened over the past couple of weeks that have, that have inspired me about, especially how things are going in the church that have just, like, yes, this is what it looks like. So our, our music team. Our music team, there's, there's four, four. I can count, yes, in front of a lot of people. I did it. There's four people in, in, on our music team. They meet about every three weeks, and they meet for probably a couple of hours. And every so often, um, sometimes I contribute to the meetings, but there's every so often, I think this last time, I probably sat there for about 15 minutes and just, just hung out. It was, just, it was great to watch them. Now, did they always agree on everything? No. Did they find a way to agree on everything? Yes. But, you know, they were so conscientious about making sure that everything that we were singing had substance to it, and it's singable, and it's a way for us to all be able to get together. And, th- and they pour their hearts out here. So I want to encourage you, by the way, you know, you know, give back, you know, sing now that the masks are off, you know, sing, let them know you're, you're all in, because as they're singing to you, they have, pre- they have prepared and prayed so much so hard, being so conscientious. Why? They're working for the Lord. Their hearts and their mouths and their hands are working for the Lord. Every day you go into the office, and there's Carla on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. Diane's there on, on Thursday. And Carla, she, she is, everything is where it, it, it is and organized. And whenever you come in, you, if you need an answer, Carla either has the answer or will get you to the person that needs the answer. That, that has the answer right. She will get you where you need to be and has that place a humming. Diane comes in on Thursday as well. Carla's working at, the, at, how, at, the, at, the, at her home, and then Diane comes in. And, and, and all of them come in, and you know when, they come, when you come in, you know, and they'll tell you, I'm doing this because I'm working for the Lord. I'm working for the Lord. And I could go on our, to our small groups. I could go to our preschool ministry. I could go to our members and guest services. All of these, these folks are rolling up their sleeves and getting to work because they know they're working for the Lord. Is that the case for all of us? Is that the case for me? Well, I know I, I love studying the scripture because I can't wait to see what God's going to teach me. And then I can turn around and be a conduit to where I can teach you what he's taught me. Do you see what's happening here? Is that God has called us to take our faith out of the garage, out of the box, and get it moving, and get it out on the highway, and he sends the Holy Spirit to continually move in us and work in us and change us so that our marriages and our families and our jobs and our churches and every last system that we touch has been affected by by being salt and light for Christ. So here's my question. let's Let's just take a look. The inventory of our of our speech. Do we build up in Christ? Or are we tearing down because things aren't going our way? If it's the latter, repent. Because God has called us and placed us in the world to build up for Christ. As He's built up us in Christ. What about your heart? You angry? What where, where's the anger coming from? Yeah, there's lots of, you, you could have been, you know, you been, could have been trying to get the kids ready for church. That could be a little bit of anger. And then, and then people actually have the audacity when you're driving here to not drive the way they should. I'm sorry, the way you want them to. And then all of a sudden, you're angry about that. And then you may be angry about something else and something else. All, the devil is always working to try to get that foothold so that your worship is shot and your, and, and your relationships are shot Let's repent of that. Let's do what we need to do to reconcile as Christ has come to reconcile us to his Father. 
That's what he did at the cross. And we need to be reconcilers as well. What about your hands? Are you using the gifts that God has given you for his glory and for the good of other people? You see, it's not about taking. It's about giving. And so some of you who may not be followers of Jesus yet, I hope there's been aspects of this where this is compelling that Christ is actually in the change business. He hasn't left you by yourself. He has done all that he, he's done all that he will, and he's given you everything you need to do everything that he commands. I pray you'll come to Christ and see the freedom that you can have in Christ. But there may be others of you who, who are in Christ, but there may be aspects where that flesh is angry about something or, or your mouth, you feel like it's your constitutional right to say whatever's on your mind, and whoom, and then you're leaving scorched earth everywhere. Repent of that, because God can change our hearts and our mouths. He, he doesn't just want our hearts. I think he wants all of us. And, our, and your hands, are you using the gifts that God has given you? to do, to glorify him, but also to help those that are around you. We're here for a reason and a purpose, and that's to take our faith out, to be sent into this world as missionaries. So let's pray that God would drive those truths home to our hearts. Heavenly Father, guide us and help us in the days ahead. And all that we do and say, whether it's our small groups or music or members meetings or or, or when we're going to our jobs or going to that daycare or we're going to, uh, to, to that hobby that we do, Father, may we take Christ with us. May we have a sanctified mouth and a sanctified heart, sanctified hands that are ready to work for you, to glorify you, but also to be able to help those that are around us. Lord, that's where it's at. Thank you for your word. And I pray, Father, as we... As we cover for next week as we look at the fact that, Lord, we don't want to do anything that's going to grieve your Holy Spirit. Lord, we want to bring joy. We want to bring joy to you in our lives because we love you. Help us, Lord, in the days ahead. Use us as we pray this and thank you and live for you. In Jesus' name.